from Two Keto LLC. It's the Obesity Code Podcast with Dr. Jason Fung and Megan Ramos. Each week, we bring you lessons and stories from the Intensive Dietary Management Program in Toronto, Canada. I'm Carl Franklin. And on today's show, we're talking about one patient's struggle with kidney disease. The Obesity Code Podcast is brought to you by Two Keto LLC, who strives to support the low-carb community with podcasts and other publications. And you can support our mission by making a monthly pledge, no matter how small, at patreon.2keto.com. Today's show centers around IDM patient John Collier, who was told by a doctor that he had staved off kidney failure for about five years by using a ketogenic diet. I was diagnosed with type 2 diabetes in 1989. A few years after that, my mother was also diagnosed with type 2 diabetes, and she died as a result of complications from that in 1996. John's mother died at a young age, typical for those of us with type 2 diabetes. She was 69 years old when she died. We are going through an epidemic of diabetes, a chronic disease that's unprecedented in human populations. That's award-winning author and science journalist Gary Taubes. But it's happening worldwide. So this, here's a disease that in the 19th century in Europe and the U.S. was an exceedingly rare disease. I mean, estimates of the prevalence of diabetes in the U.S. in the late 19th century in hospitals was maybe one in every 1,000 or 3,000 hospital patients had diabetes. In the VA hospitals in the U.S. today, one in four patients have diabetes. One in 11 Americans have diabetes. I mean, these are enormous increases. If you look at the CDC numbers since the early 1960s, there's been a 700% increase in the prevalence of diabetes. I mean, if this was any other disease, particularly an infectious disease, you would have investigative committees, teams of scientists, people in white coats with electronic gear walking around our backyards as we speak, trying to figure out what was the cause of this. The highest recorded A1C I have is 78. G'day, Richard here. The A1C is a measure of your average glucose exposure over the past three months. John is using the new European IFCC units. In American terms, John would have had an HbA1c of roughly 9.3%. Normal, non-diabetic, is around 5%. My weight varied a lot. Um, when I was in my late teens, early 20s, it would have been about 150 pounds. By the time I was in my mid-30s, it was double that. Uh, I was living in America at the time, and I sort of embraced the culture, and uh, I was eating and drinking to excess, I would say. Over the years, my control was not, not very good. Um, as with so many people in the early stages, I wasn't suffering from any symptoms. I was living a normal life. I was healthy. I was vigorous. And the doctors didn't seem too concerned about it. I remember one doctor once looking at my results and saying, well, your blood glucose is uh, 12, 13. You seem to operate okay on that. He wasn't too concerned. A blood glucose of roughly 12 millimoles per litre it's about 220 milligrams per deciliter in American units. I was, I was overweight. My A1C was pretty high. Um, but I wasn't really showing any symptoms, so I wasn't really that, too, that concerned. Um, as the years went by, I did make efforts to lose weight. And I noticed that when I'd lost weight, my blood glucose did improve a little. But it still fluctuated wildly after meals. John took the advice that we are all given in order to lose weight. Just eat less. Low-fat, low calorie-restricted. And I was, I was pretty, pretty disciplined about it. I set myself a target of 1,500 calories a day, and I found it was quite easy to achieve 1,200 a day, which is what I stuck at. 
And we heard all about this strategy in Episode 8 of the Obesity Code podcast, Yo-Yo Dieting. When I really started measuring everything, I lost um, three stone, that's over 40 pounds, in about four months. And at that time, my weight would have been about 220 pounds, I guess. And I got it down. But I, I could never keep the weight off. I mean, a year was the longest I ever kept my weight down. And it always went back on because I would get hungry. I'd have cravings. i get bored. i just think, what the hell? It's not doing me any good. And i just give up. And there's the yo-yo. Up and down and up and down. And I started to read that um, reversal was possible for type 2 diabetes. And I read about Professor Roy Taylor's work with his so-called Newcastle diet. And I decided his diet looked far harsher and too restrictive for me to enjoy. So I thought, well, he's devised the diet to mimic the effects of bariatric surgery. So why don't I devise my own diet to mimic the effects of his diet? And I really um, worked out a sort of real food equivalent of his Newcastle diet. I didn't like the idea of his diet because it contained meal replacement shakes. And I'm a big fan of natural food. So I had what was still a calorie restricted diet because I was so wedded to that psychologically. I didn't want to give up the idea of calorie restriction. Uh, and I was still nervous because of what the doctors had been telling me. They were very reluctant for me to try because they said they didn't know what the result could be in the future. Uh, but I knew that the result of what they were doing at the moment wasn't very good as far as I was concerned, and I was prepared to take a risk. So I just halved my carbohydrate intake. Well, 100 years ago, before insulin was available for clinical use, the treatment for diabetes was fairly consistently a low-carbohydrate diet. In fact, a very low-carbohydrate diet was life-prolonging in type 1 or juvenile diabetes. That's Harvard professor and New York Times best-selling author of Always Hungry, David Ludwig. Children could be kept alive in some cases for years with an ultra-low, or what we now call a ketogenic, low-carbohydrate diet. With the discovery of insulin, um, people could eat more carbohydrate and control the surge of blood sugar by adjusting the insulin dose. Over the years, as a consequence, the recommendations for carbohydrate greatly liberalized until the 1980s and 1990s when fat was considered universally unhealthy as a nutrient, um, led to recommendations for all people, including diabetes, of a very high carbohydrate diet, up to 60% of calories as carbohydrate or more. In fact, the classic uh, American Diabetes Association recommendations during that time was 60-20-20, 60% carbohydrate, 20% protein, 20% fat. Now, since then, um, recommendations have continued to change to varying degrees among professional organizations around the world so that the American Diabetes Association now doesn't have one specific nutrient target and encourages individualization. But as a starting point, uh, on their website to this day, suggest aiming for 45 to 60 grams of carbohydrate per meal. John had stumbled onto a way of treating type 2 diabetes with diet. He not only saw successful weight loss, but more stable blood glucose. Um, once I'd seen that difference, that then gave me the confidence to try and reducing my carbohydrates even more. And the lower I went in carbs, the lower and more stable my blood glucose became. My weight just kept falling off. By the time I really started switching to low carb, I'd already lost quite a bit of weight. I was back down to about 220 pounds, and I was aiming to lose at least another 20 pounds. And I just kept losing weight, and I got right down to about 170 pounds, 
with no, no real effort on my part. I still kept recording all my food. My, my wife very faithfully weighed it all. And I devised some spreadsheets and some software to um, convert all the, the weights and foods into the macronutrients. So I got measures of um, carbohydrate, fat, salt, and protein. But what I noticed was it was easier to restrict myself to uh, fewer calories because I didn't have the hunger between meals. I now generally eat once or twice a day and a lot of the time that's more out of habit or because I enjoy food so much. And what did John's healthcare professionals think about his low carbohydrate approach? I've been going about twice a year to a diabetes and renal clinic and the endocrinologist in the clinic um, wasn't a fan of low carb. She didn't understand anything about it, didn't want me to try it unless a dietitian approved and the dietitian knew even less about it. So I just ignored them both. I did keep my family doctor fully informed all the time on the theory that if I really did myself some damage, at least she'd know where to start putting me back together again. Unfortunately, John developed a disease that many type 2 diabetics end up with, kidney disease. Well, I've been in end-stage renal failure for probably about the last four or five years. It probably started going back almost more than five years ago, maybe ten years ago. Um, the, the kidney function was getting lower and lower. Now, to be clear, John developed kidney disease when he still had high blood sugar. I also, about a couple of years ago, had problems um, common to men of my age of pros with prostate. And our treatment for that consisted of inserting a catheter, which guaranteed permanent urinary infections while I was waiting for surgery. And after seven months of waiting for surgery on our wonderful free National Health Service, I lost patients and paid privately to have the surgery done. Which, which cured all of the urinary infections, but by then my kidneys were so far gone they didn't recover. Diabetic uh, kidney disease, or what we call diabetic nephropathy, progresses in several stages. And that, of course, is Dr. Jason Fung. The first stage from uh, diabetes um, is that each stage takes roughly uh, five years. That's just a general average. Uh, sometimes it progresses more quickly and sometimes a little bit more slowly, but if you want to take an overall average, it takes about you know, four to five years to progress through each stage. The uh, total time from onset of type 2 diabetes to diabetic kidney disease is on average 15 to 20 years. But it can actually present before the diagnosis of diabetes itself. So the hyperinsulinemia, which precedes the diagnosis of type 2 diabetes, can actually cause a lot of kidney damage. American pathologist Dr. Joseph Kraft analyzed almost 15,000 glucose tolerance tests. He also tested the patient's insulin levels for each test, and he was able to see many of these patients over the years as they developed diabetes. So he went looking for patterns that he could use to predict who would become diabetic and who wouldn't. He was able to identify unique patterns of high insulin levels that preceded by over a decade the high levels of glucose that would eventually indicate a diagnosis of diabetes. So before you start to feel sick from diabetes, before even your doctor notices your blood sugars are high, you could have been overproducing insulin for 10 to 15 years. So uh, I've had several cases in my career where I've biopsied uh, kidneys because I saw a lot of protein in the urine, which is sort of a very common uh, symptom of diabetic nephropathy. Uh, and people only had pre-diabetes, so I thought, well, that's very strange, so I did the biopsy, and lo and behold, when the biopsies came back, there was classic diabetic damage in the uh, kidneys. So, what are the stages of kidney disease? So, the stages that uh, diabetic nephropathy go through is that uh, you start from normal and then you go into actually a stage of hyperfiltration. That is, remember that the kidneys clean the blood. 
the blood goes through the kidneys. The kidneys are supposed to keep all the good stuff in, like uh, the protein, for example, and let all the bad stuff, all the toxins and so on, out into the urine. So uh, when the first thing that you see is that there's too much uh, blood being filtered through the kidney, and it's called hyperfiltration. So when you measure the kidney function in this stage, it, it looks sort of even better than normal. That's not a good sign. That's actually an indication of diabetic uh, nephropathy. So if hyperfiltration is the first stage, what's the second stage? Then you move to a stage called microalbuminuria. And albumin is the type of protein that we measure in the uh, urine. So when your doctor does a urine test, one of the things they measure is how much protein there is, which is albumin. If you just measure the concentration of albumin, you will be fooled because if you drink a lot of water and you dilute your urine, it looks like the concentration of albumin goes down. So you correct for it by measuring the creatinine in the urine and, and that keeps a stable sort of uh, ratio. So you look for uh, albumin to creatinine ratio, sometimes also called ACR. That's usually the first sort of noticeable step in the progression of diabetic kidney disease. So at what point does this usually happen for a diabetic? In a typical type uh, 1 diabetic, it's kind of 5 to 10 years. Type 2 can happen anytime and sometimes presents alongside with the diabetes. But once you start to see this, urine, uh, this microalbuminuria, then uh, you know you're well on your way to established uh, kidney disease. When I see this, I get uh, on people to really uh, think about uh, tightening their uh, diet and trying to reverse their diabetes before it goes any further. This is usually the stage that is still somewhat reversible. So we do have um, several patients, not a lot of patients, but some patients who go from microalbuminuria back down to normal. So if the protein in the urine indicates a problem, does that mean we should eat less protein? So the presence of uh, protein in the urine always prompts people to say, well, should uh, we uh, eat more protein, eat less protein? I says it doesn't really matter. The point is that the, the kidney is like sort of a sieve or a colander. So imagine that you're washing blueberries in the sink. The blueberries go into the colander, you run the water and the water goes out and the sieve holds all the good stuff, the blueberries inside. That's what the kidneys do. So the, the kidneys hold all the good stuff like the protein and let all the urine through. If you start to see the blueberries in the sink, there's nothing wrong with the blueberries. It's not that you have to put more blueberries in or put less blueberries in. The problem is that you know there's a hole in your colander. And that's the same thing with the kidney. So once you start seeing protein spilling out into the urine, it's not that the protein's bad, it's that the sieve or the kidney, the glomerulus, which is the, the, the functional part of the kidney, is got holes in it and is leaking out this protein. And the more protein is leaking out, the worse it is. Does more protein in the urine imply more kidney damage? Just like the blueberries, if you see a lot of blueberries spilling into the sink, you know you've got a lot of holes. So it's the same thing with the protein, but it doesn't mean you eat more protein or eat less protein. The point is that you have to understand that it's the diabetes that is causing damage to the kidney and therefore you must reverse this uh, type 2 diabetes before you do more damage. But the damage that's there is largely not reversible. So that's stage two, microalbuminuria. What's the third stage? If you continue to progress, you get more and more uh, amount of protein uh, spilling out, and that's the stage called macroalbuminuria. And that's something you can detect just on regular dipsticks. You'll see a lot of protein spilling out. And um, it just kind of progresses more and more. Then you hit the stage where your kidney function actually starts to decline. You know, once you hit the sort of um, a certain amount of protein in the urine, at that point, it largely progresses no matter what you do, which is why I always want to treat people very, very early in their disease because 
once it gets past a certain point, I know that there's very little that I'll be able to do to reverse this. So what is the final stage? Eventually it comes to a stage where the kidney uh, function has declined somewhere around 90 to 95 percent where we have to do dialysis. So dialysis is a process that doesn't help the kidneys, but what it does is it artificially cleans the blood. And there's two types of dialysis. There's hemodialysis, where we take the blood out um, of the body, we wash it through a machine, and then we give it back to them. There's another type called peritoneal dialysis, where we put a little bit of what looks like uh, water uh, into the abdomen. And four times a day, you change that, that water out. What comes out looks a bit like urine, and what goes in looks a bit like water, because that's all the waste product that is coming out from that. So that's the process of dialysis, and that's really what I see a lot of. By the time John started low carb, his kidneys had been in decline for over 10 years. In John's case, uh, he, he was able to implement uh, intermittent fasting uh, very successfully. He was able to reverse his type 2 diabetes, but he was too late to save his kidneys. Um, and it's really strange that we think that intermittent fasting, say not eating for 24 hours, is such a radical a uh, crazy way of doing things and it's so dangerous and yet we accept that if we don't if we continue let these people continue on their path we know they're going to have kidney failure and go on dialysis it was too late to save the kidneys yeah yeah a, a, a doctor friend of mine has calculated he he estimates that i probably delayed the onset of dialysis by about 5 years by by the change of diet if I were to start now, I would have gone as low carb, even zero carb if I could, right from the start. Because I have been attending a clinic that a doctor friend of mine runs. And I've seen people who've started really low carb and within, within a week one of them had halved his blood glucose level. Others have, within a matter of a few months, have become non-diabetic, have lost weight, have become healthier, stronger mentally more alert. One of the things that we get asked a lot is whether um, a low carbohydrate diet or intermittent fasting, for example, can reverse diabetic kidney disease. And as you know, I'm a nephrologist, I'm a kidney specialist, and this is how I became interested in the entire uh, process in the first place. And when I got into the field of uh, sort of obesity medicine, I actually had very, very high hopes that reversing somebody's diabetes would reverse their kidney disease. Unfortunately, it's largely not been true. So there are isolated cases that uh, have shown reversal of diabetic kidney disease. So kidney disease goes through several stages for diabetes. So what's uh, important is that this disease, once it has progressed, is largely not reversible. Uh, so it has to be prevented, not reversed. So whereas diet type 2 diabetes is largely reversible even until almost the end stage, uh, the damage that's done by the diabetes is not so easily reversible. And this holds true for many of the diseases. So diabetic eye disease, diabetic nerve damage, uh, heart disease, and so on. Once you have it, uh, it's not so easily treated, even though the underlying uh, diabetes is easily reversible. So it's kind of like uh, when you think about, for example, something like uh, changing the oil on your car. Suppose that you never change the oil in your car, and then your car breaks down. And then you say, okay, well, now I'm going to change the oil in my car. Well, it doesn't do a lot of good. Uh, it's still good to do it to prevent further damage, but it's not going to reverse the damage. You may have heard me say this on the Two Keto Dudes podcast, but when I was first looking into doing Atkins, I was dissuaded by a nurse who said that low-carb diets were hard on the kidneys. Yeah, I, I think their reasoning for that is if it's a very high-protein diet, that can put a strain on the kidneys. Um, but Atkins isn't necessarily a high-protein diet. I mean, what I've settled on now is, is what I think a lot of people are calling uh, low-carb, moderate-protein high healthy fat combined with intermittent fasting because I find that really magnifies the effect of the low carb. Certainly does for me. One big misconception is that high protein diets cause kidney disease and that was uh, thought to be true oh, probably about 20 years ago but was largely disproven and nobody really follows that anymore. 
So about 15 years ago, there was a study called the MDRD study, which looked at very low protein diets and kidney disease. So people who had established kidney disease, they got put on these very low protein diets and it didn't make their kidney function any better or worse. So there was really no benefit. Sometimes is a bit of a uh, perception that eating too much protein will cause kidney damage. It does increase the load of nitrogenous waste that is um, protein which has a lot of nitrogen if you eat a lot of protein you have too much and the body has to get rid of that nitrogen and you excrete it out into the urine and normal kidneys will do that just fine so if you don't have any kidney disease then you don't really have to worry about how much you're eating or not eating if you do have sort of uh, chronic kidney disease stage three or four or five which is the more severe uh, cases of kidney disease then you should avoid excessive protein. Everybody wants to know, how much protein should I eat every day? The question, which there's no good answer to, is what is excessive? And here you get all different kinds of answers. Uh, so I'll give you the sort of recommended daily allowance. So the recommended daily allowance is 0.8 grams per kilograms of lean weight. Some people said it should be uh, total weight, which doesn't make a lot of sense to me because if you are very uh, fat, for example, you're going to have a, a lot of higher weight, but that fat tissue does not require protein. So it doesn't make sense to account for that. So 0.8 grams per kilogram of lean mass. There are people who recommend higher and people who recommend lower. So certain doctors say you should eat very high protein, like one and a half grams per kilo per day. Um, I'm, I tend not to agree with that, uh, dep but it all depends on your situation. Proteins are built up of these building blocks called amino acids. So your body sort of assembles the amino acids into different proteins, sort of like you can take Lego and build different things out of it. Your body has a certain turnover of proteins, so proteins get old and your body will break it down. If you go on an extended fast, for example, and you really deplete the body of this, what you find is that most of this amino acids are reabsorbed through the urine. And that makes sense because the body's not going to waste protein if it really needs it. Uh, and for this reason, some people say that you actually need very, very little uh, protein intake, even down to 0.4 grams per kilo per day. How did this number of 0.8 grams of protein come to be? Who calculated that? The way that they got the number, the, the recommended daily allowance of 0.8 grams per kilo per day is that in the 50s or 60s or whenever they decided to do this, they uh, actually surveyed uh, a number of healthy people. So remember, these are people completely free of disease, very well, and they looked at the average American. So remember, again, Americans were eating much more protein than anybody else in the world. Everybody else in the world uh, was trying to recover from the war and was not nearly as wealthy as 1950s America. So America was eating, on average, 0.6 grams per kilo per day. So when they decided to uh, make a recommendation, they figured, well, the average is 0.6. So people are healthy at 0.6. Now we're going to add two standard deviations above because we want to make sure everybody gets enough. So we're going to make the recommendation at 0.8 grams per kilo per day so that everybody gets the 0.6 that we think that they need. So that's how the 0.8 came about. But remember, in 1950s America, everybody's eating 0.6 on average and doing very well. So um, what's the right answer? Again, it depends on who you ask. I think somewhere on the order of 0.6 to 0.8 is perfectly reasonable to me. Um, if somebody has a lot of weight to lose, then I think they have excessive protein stores. So the collagen, the connective tissue, the skin, um, all that stuff that holds the fat cells, for example, that's all protein that needs to be broken down. So I think you need to go on the lower side if you have weight to lose. If you don't have weight to lose, then 0.6 to 0.8 seems perfectly reasonable to me. Um, again, if you are on dialysis like John, however, 
it's a totally different story because there's uh, protein losses from various things like blood, uh, chronic blood loss and so, so on. So those are special situations. So even though John's kidneys were failing, by 2013, he had reversed his type 2 diabetes. I had been told at the renal and diabetes clinic not to experiment with that. So I went back six months later and I was prepared to tell the endocrinologist that I wanted her to transfer me to one of her colleagues because I didn't want to see her again professionally. But before I could do that, she told me not to come back to the diabetes part of the clinic because I was no longer diabetic. She said, my blood, my blood glucose levels were now normal. And so being polite, I said, I said, well, I'm sorry not to be seeing you again because I'd just like to thank you for the, the help that you've given me in the past and, you know, I won't be seeing you again. And she just said, oh, yes, you will. You'll be back. So, so I thought, how discouraging, not even a well done. And it was about that time, I guess, 2013, probably even early 2014, that I came across Jason Fung on the internet and started following his blog. I emailed him and asked the question, and I got a response. I was amazed, you know, a doctor replying to me. And then they started the intensive dietary management program, which I joined, and I've really never looked back since then. So when I met John, he was um, quite slender, between about 150 and 160 pounds. That, of course, is Megan Ramos, director of the Intensive Dietary Management Program. Megan had just started the long-distance program three years ago when John joined. His blood sugar levels were fantastic. Um, his sugar levels would range from you know four to five uh, all of the time. So they were they were under ninety. They were between seventy and ninety for our American friends. He sent me a food diary every time we talked, and his foods were fantastic. So Megan was really wondering what this guy was doing in the IDM program. He had such great blood sugar, and he reversed his diabetes. Well, then John told me that he had stage 5 diabetic kidney disease. Stage 5 kidney disease occurs shortly before dialysis is required or a kidney transplant. John is a man with a tremendous amount of common sense, and he said to me, he knows that fasting probably can't prevent dialysis or can't prevent his kidneys from completely deteriorating and him going into kidney failure. Um, but he did say, you know, if there's a chance I can get an extra day or an extra couple of days or even an extra couple of hours by introducing fasting into my life to help prevent this kidney failure, then that's okay. He, he'd be happy with an extra an hour or an extra day or an extra week. So just to reiterate, John had reversed type 2 diabetes on his own just by doing research. In the UK, um, Arjun Panasar set up the um, diabetes.co.uk website, and I followed that. I followed their low-carb program, um, really to validate it, to see, and I found it agreed very much with what I'd already done myself. And I, th I found, therefore, I could then recommend that to anybody who asked me for advice as, as, a, as a way to get started with low carb. And then Sam Felton started the public health collaboration, and I joined that. And I've been to both the conferences. I, I met Jason Fung at um, the 2017 conference in Manchester. One of the things that uh, sort of drives us uh, at this, uh, the intensive dietary management program is I don't really want to see anybody on dialysis from type 2 diabetes anymore. And it's 60-70% uh, of the cases that uh, go on dialysis are due to this disease. And the reason I always think that it's uh, so hard to watch people do it is that one, it really takes over your life. That is, if you do hemodialysis, it's four times, uh, four hours, three times a week. Uh, you're basically just spending your whole life doing dialysis. And the other thing is that at the back of my mind, I know that this whole thing was completely preventable. If we had gotten the people the right information sort of 10 or 15 years ago, 
then they wouldn't have this problem and I wouldn't need to put them on dialysis. And that's what really bothers me is that I know that all of this sort of suffering was preventable just by getting the right information about low carbohydrate diets, about uh, intermittent fasting to reverse the type 2 diabetes because the uh, important thing is that if you don't have diabetes, then you can't develop diabetic kidney disease because you don't have that disease. And because the type 2 diabetes is a dietary condition, then changing the diet has the power to prevent all the complications, not just the kidney disease, but also the uh, blindness, the amputations, the foot ulcers, the heart attacks, the strokes, and so on. On August 11th, 2016, John suffered an emergency. That was when my kidneys failed completely. Well, I was suffering from breathing problems in the night. It's quite a warm summer for us, and I found the only way I could overcome the breathing problems was to get up, sit in an upright position, and um, sit in the coolest part of the house, which was the computer room. So, incidentally, I got quite a bit of work done on the computer in the middle of the night because I couldn't lay flat. What I now know is that was pulmonary edema, as fluid was building up in my lungs, which was the real final collapse of my kidneys. I'd been to my family doctor and they'd been treating me for asthma and indigestion, which is another misdiagnosis. And I'd been admitted to what we call A&E, accident and emergency, which you probably call the emergency room, a couple of times. And each time, by the time I got there, because the only one that was open in the middle of the night was a 20-mile drive away, the paramedics took me in. I'd been sitting in an air-conditioned car for an hour on the way to the hospital, and my symptoms had more or less disappeared. So the doctors in the emergency room sent me home again, saying, you're not ill enough for us to do anything with. Go and see your doctor in the morning. But the third time they had to keep me because I was obviously so ill, they, they couldn't turn me away. Um, I had made a decision to decline dialysis because I'd determined to do what I could by my own efforts to defeat diabetes. And dialysis didn't appeal to me as a permanent treatment. And I thought, well, you know, if I'm going to have a shorter life, that's it at least I'll end in a dignified fashion. Um, and now that I'm on dialysis, I know that I was right. It, it, it's, it's not something that I enjoy. So you might be asking yourself, why then did John decide to go through with dialysis? Um, because my nephrologist was very concerned. I could see that he had big problems with one of his patients letting himself die under his care. And I had an agreement with him. It was not a written agreement, but it was an uns a spoken agreement between us that if I was admitted unconscious and incapable of deciding my fate, then I gave him permission to keep me alive. I knew that John was in fantastic shape. Other than his kidney disease, he literally had no other health issues. He stopped the diabetes before it really poisoned any other part of his body. He had lost all kinds of weight. He was in tremendous shape. And his energy levels, well, things considering with his, with his kidney failure, they were still really good. So I thought, you know, John would have probably the easiest transition into dialysis of anyone I've ever met or been exposed to. So every now and then when I would talk to John, I would talk to him about, you know, this great success story that I have observed in the clinic with a patient starting dialysis. Or when I had a patient who would travel from Toronto to Florida for six months and be able to do their dialysis in Florida, or they would go on a dialysis cruise, or they would go to Europe and still be able to do their dialysis there and had a great time on their European trip, or they would go to Australia and do their dialysis down under. Um, and and still be able to take in all of the sites and, and participate in the culture and have their dialysis treatments. So I would always tell John some of these stories as they popped up. And he knew what I was getting at. <laughs> I was trying not to be too pushy, but John was really adamant that he was not going to go on dialysis that the quality of his life would be too terrible and that he didn't want to live that way. So the only other alternative at that point is death. 
if you're not going to go on dialysis, not have a transplant, then you're going to die. You need your kidneys. It's actually August 11th, 2016. Um, I had a meeting with John in the afternoon. I always met with John in my afternoon. It was his evening. that He was in kidney failure. And it was literally probably about a matter of hours that he had left to live um, if he didn't go on dialysis. And at this point, I had become pretty fond of John, and it was just hard because I knew after that conversation that I probably wouldn't speak to him again. Sorry, guys. So I knew I probably wouldn't see him again or speak with him again because he had been so hell-bent for two years about not going on dialysis. So we talked a little bit that day. I gave him my final dialysis pitch. I told him what an inspiration he was to me and to everyone else who he had participated in IDM with um, and that he had such a great message to spread. And I also tried to <laughs> guilt him a little bit. John, um, he had commented that day that I looked, um, I looked nice. And I remember it was August 11th for a reason because that's my birthday. So that evening I was going out to celebrate my birthday. So I got all dressed up. But after, after that call, when John and I said goodbye, he was going to go to the hospital. And I assumed after getting off the phone with him that he was going to go there to die. Um, so much to my surprise, <laughs> um, John came to the revolution that, um, his message was too important and that it would be too selfish for him to die. Also, I don't, I don't think he would have broken my heart and, and decided to die on my birthday. <laughs> um, so he went on, he went on dialysis that day on August 11th, 2016. He started hemodialysis. In the end, I, I was conscious. I could make up my own mind. Uh, and quite frankly, dying was so painful, I thought, well, I, I'll accept being kept alive as, as second best. Um, and they did. They kept me alive. They, they quickly took a lot of fluid out of me um, to uh, replace the function of my kidneys. Um, and I started hemodialysis, emergency hemodialysis. I then progressed to peritoneal dialysis. Peritoneal dialysis went badly for John, right from the outset. I picked up an infection. I didn't have any symptoms, but there was an infection. The dialysis wasn't very effective. And in the end, they had to remove the peritoneal dialysis catheter in an emergency operation because of the infection that had built up. And I went back to hemodialysis for a few months. I'm now back on peritoneal dialysis. Seems to be working well. And I'm on the waiting list for a kidney transplant. John didn't just get grief from his endocrinologist. His renal dietitians really didn't approve of his diet. Yeah, the renal. I, I've been assigned to a renal dietitian, and she tells me that um, dialysis will. I think eat up my muscles and I must eat a minimum of 80 grams of protein a day to stop my muscles waste, wasting away. Now I, I go to the gym twice a week and see a personal trainer and they don't see any diminution in my muscle mass. I have been feeling very weak and unwell over the last year on and off but um, I'm starting to feel better again now and I don't think I've got any loss of strength at all. So how much protein does John eat? I aim for 50 grams a day, and it quite often exceeds that. It's so easy to eat more protein than you, than you uh, intend. But I'm probably, some days it's under 50 grams, most days it's slightly over. I don't find it as difficult as I thought it would be, it's just a matter of um, concentration. And I don't think I could eat a 12-ounce steak anymore. One of the sad parts about this uh, case uh, is that John had to reverse his diabetes, not because of the health professionals that were around him, but in spite 
of them. That is, all his doctors, all his dietitians told him he was doing something crazy and stupid and he was going to kill himself when the truth was that if he continued eating the way he was eating, he would definitely have killed himself. Uh, it's what got him into that problem in the first place, and yet they don't want him to change what he's doing, which doesn't make sense. It's the very definition of insanity. And uh, the sad part is that we can't trust the uh, very people who are supposed to be helping us. And it's not that the doctors and dietitians are bad people. It's just that the sort of system doesn't accept that there are alternatives that uh, that are that are feasible, that are good. Uh, things like eating real food, cutting down the carbohydrates, and so on. You see all this sort of intrinsic uh, resistance to these ideas. Anybody who thinks that the calories uh, doesn't make sense is uh, immediately labeled a quack, for example. And these are the sort of things that we try and get out there, trying to appeal to people's common sense. I, I, I was so glad to be able to meet Jason Fung and shake his hand at the PHC conference. And, and just to tell him, you know, what wonderful work he's been doing. Uh, he and in, in, in our country, David Unwin has done so much to bring hope to so many people that I, I just want to do whatever I can in, in my small way to support the medical professionals who are doing that. I, I, I don't want to compete with them or replace them. I, you know, I'm not qualified to give medical advice. What I am qualified to do is to attest to how it is to live with diabetes. John is very happy to hold up his experiences as a cautionary tale about what happens if you don't take care of yourself. And he's now an ambassador with Sam Feltham's public health collaboration in the UK. For example, the local medical center that I attend, I wrote to the, um, the lead partner for diabetes, the lead partner for obesity, one of the nurses I know uh, is the lead on diabetes care, and I wrote to the practice manager, and I, I had no response, not even an acknowledgement from any of them. I've heard that they are starting to use community um, dietitian led patient groups, and I asked to be referred to that because I said, by attending patient groups, I find that keeps me motivated uh, to stick to my diet. Uh, not that I need much motivation now because the, the diet I'm on now is, is enjoyable and sustainable. But I, I find it helps me to stay motivated and I think I have something to offer to the other patients. And there's one group where a doctor invites me to go because he says it, it, uh, it helps the patients. But the doctor I was seeing at the time said um, she, ca she can't allow me to go to one of those groups because it would confuse the other patients to hear me say something that's against the majority of the evidence. I, d I told her that all of my friends and relatives are far too intelligent um, and that they're capable of making up their own minds when presented with the facts. And I think sometimes doctors have very low expectations of their patients. Doctors often don't paint an accurate picture about the consequences of inaction. That's right, yeah. And, well, doctors are people. They, they, they don't want to upset people. They, they want to give people a, um, a sort of rosy outlook on life. And I, I think they're failing in their duties when they do that. But they're doing it from the best of intentions. And I don't know how it works in, in your system, but certainly under the National Health Service, doctors are becoming increasingly overloaded. I mean, I, I've been a patient of my family doctor practice for over 40 years, approaching 50 years now. And I don't think I, I saw a doctor until about 10 years ago. But when I did, you phoned the doctor and you saw him the same day. Now you've got to wait maybe three weeks for a non-urgent appointment. You can see a doctor the same day if it's urgent, but it won't be the doctor you see regularly, and half of the 10-minute appointment will be t taken up with them taking a history from you. 
one of the things that we try to do at our IDM clinic is uh, treat people very early so that they don't develop the complications and we prevent the complications. So whereas I had high hopes prior to reverse the kidney disease, it doesn't look reversible and therefore you have to treat people almost 10 or 15 years before they get their uh, kidney disease or heart attack or stroke in order to prevent that uh, problem. So John, what advice would you give people who've just been diagnosed with type 2 diabetes or pre-diabetes? I say you've got to seize the opportunity. You've got to control your diabetes before it controls you. By the time you realize how bad it is, it could well be too late. Even after over 25 years of poorly controlled diabetes, I was still able to substantially reverse my diabetes. I, at one stage, it was out of stubbornness, I, I didn't put myself forward to be registered as blind, but technically I was blind, I had so little vision. And I had some surgery which helped, but I'm now back to technically 20-20 vision. I can drive a car again. Um, for three years I didn't dare sit behind the wheel of a car. I was lame, I persisted in trying to do a two mile walk. Uh, several times a week, but I would stop every 20 yards to catch my breath. Within a few months of reversing my diabetes, I was strolling that two miles in, in less than an hour with, with no hesitation. It, it really made me feel five to ten years younger, and although it was too late to save my kidney, it gave me five years of vigorous active life that I wouldn't have had. And if I'd carried on with the treatment for diabetes that I was getting and that thousands, if not millions of people are still getting, I don't think I would have survived until now anyway. Wow. Thank you, John. That certainly is a powerful story. Well, that's, I, I, I'm not important, but what's important is the message that needs to get out uh, you know, in your country and in mine and, and around the world, because there's so much that people can do. The medical profession doesn't have the resources to cure us all. The idea that you can eat, drink what you want, don't worry, we've got a pill for you that'll cure it all, uh, that's, that's not going to work. So many people wait till it's too late to get better. And kidneys, other than making you a little bit tired, they don't hurt till you're in total kidney failure. And I can't tell you the number of times grown men have cried and fallen to the ground at my feet because they would wish to go back and do anything to prevent dialysis. And I've watched this since I was a kid because I was in clinical research and I would always see the patients after the nephrologist, the kidney doctor saw the patients. So I would see doctors, I would see these colleagues of mine tell their patient, you got to give up the beer, you got to stop eating the junk food, your kidneys filter everything in your body and you've got to stop, you've got to clean it up, you've got to stop. And I've seen this happen over and over and over again. And um, But the patients, their kidneys don't hurt. They don't cause them grief on a day-to-day -day basis. And then all of a sudden, they're gone. And there's nothing you can do. You need dialysis, you need a transplant, or you're going to die. You know, they said, but my kidneys didn't hurt. I didn't know. I didn't know. If I knew, I would have changed things. But we told you. We told you. We told you. And you didn't listen because your kidneys didn't physically hurt and they didn't stop you from functioning regularly on a day-to-day -day basis. So John's story needs to be heard and shared and I'm so grateful for him for doing this podcast with us today. John is still on the donor list for a kidney. If you'd like to be a hero and save a life, contact your local organ donor organization. That's our story for this week. You've been listening to the Obesity Code podcast. Lessons and Stories from the Intensive Dietary Management Program. The Obesity Code podcast is brought to you by 2Keto LLC, who strives to support the low-carb community with podcasts and other publications. And you can support our mission by making a monthly pledge, no matter how small, at patreon.2keto.com. I'm Carl Franklin. We'll see you next time.